I'll just introduce our speaker now and, and get straight on with it. Turtle Rescues New South Wales is part of Wild Conservation, a professional fauna management company and is a family operated firm dedicated to the care of Australian wildlife, both captive and wild. Turtle Rescues works to ensure the best possible outcome for displaced or threatened native wildlife and provides a volunteer service to the greater community by taking in injured or displaced turtles for release into suitable habitat in the wild. Kane Durant, snake catcher, reptile expert and passionate wildlife conservationist will tell us of efforts to save turtles from urbanisation. So with that uh, brief introduction, Kane, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you all for having me here this evening. It is a little alien, I guess, doing it um, from afar through Zoom. Uh, but I hope this works out and everybody enjoys this evening's presentation. So, my name is Kane Durant and I do work with freshwater turtles here in Australia. Uh, here in Australia, we don't have any true tortoises uh, that are terrestrial animals with their elephantine feet. Uh, and the animals that people have fondly called tortoises over the years are in fact sort of turtles. Uh, I run Wild Conservation, a fauna management firm in southwest Sydney with my wife Rachel. Wild isn't just my job, it's really my life and it's, it's all I do, it's, it's what I live and breathe. And my work at Wild sees me come into contact with a variety of animals uh, and people, uh, though I think I prefer the animals. And turtles, but I also do work as a snake catcher uh, and I do provide fauna management services, which capturing a whole range of animals, um, but generally it's uh, that of the reptilian kind. Uh, so snakes, lizards, and uh, so tonight I'm just going to be going through uh, several photos um, of work, and uh, we're going to be having a look at a few different things, especially the issues that are driving uh, decline in in our fresh turtle species, but. Um, I'll just do a bit of an introduction into uh, everything that we do at Wild and at Turtle Rescues New South Wales. So uh, in the snake catching, really just removing problem animals, uh, people call them problem animals from uh, residents' homes or businesses. So you can see there I'm uh, handling a variety of snakes. Uh, the middle photo there is an eastern water dragon uh, captured from a development in Western Sydney that was disturbing some East water dragon habitat. We're engaged to come in and, and remove those lizards and relocate them a little way up the river. Development uh, went ahead. Um, but uh, like I said, I do specialise in freshwater turtles. So, and that often sees me covered in mud, uh, like my colleague Shane there, who's sort of hidden from view a little bit in that photo. But uh, we do get down and dirty and, and catch a lot of turtles in mud and, and in drained wetlands, um, which I'll talk a little more on soon. A uh, major project that I've been involved in is the Meaning River Turtle Project uh, in 2018. Here in New South Wales, we do have three species of turtle. So uh, a lot of people wouldn't even know that we had three species of turtle in total here in New South Wales, but uh, we do. And uh, three of those are in fact endangered. So this one here is the Manning River Turtle, um, which is what the project was uh, the focus of. And that there is the first known photograph of that animal in situ. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I took that photograph. So I was involved in the phase uh, to, to uh, map this species uh, population and density in that area. And I took my trusty GoPro diving with these animals. And I managed to capture that photo there of a mature male turtle of that endangered. It's been widely used in all of the promotional material uh, surrounding that animal's uh, insurance population that's been set up at the Australian Reptile Park and Aussie Ark. And there's a photo from one of those early surveys uh, with an adult 
herbicide there, the meaning river turtle. And uh, because of my contributions to projects like that and others, I was recently using the Species Survival Commission for tortoises and freshwater turtles of the world. So that's a specialist group of advisors uh, that assist in turtle conservation internationally. And there's one of our local species, the Eastern Long Turtle. So here in Sydney, we've got two species of turtle um, that occur naturally, and that is the Eastern Long Neck Turtle and the Sydney Basin Turtle, which is a short neck species. Uh, the short neck species isn't often seen because it is a river dwelling animal, and uh, they don't often leave the water really only to bask or to lay their eggs. The Long Neck Turtle, um, as I'm sure all of you know, will cross the road in times of rain, uh, particularly this week, um, that can be spotted uh, with these animals on the move, looking for uh, new breeding grounds or new water, new feeding opportunities, whatever it might be, them to migrate during times of rain. This one here uh, was fitted with a radio transmitter. We captured it in one of our jobs and we were working with the University of Western Sydney at the time. That's an ongoing relationship that we have with the University of Western Sydney. And uh, this animal here was fitted with a radar, uh, as was uh, about a dozen of its friends. And we released them into spots where we would typically relocate these animals, just so do after we release them uh, from their homes that uh, we've had to move them from. Uh, and the results have been positive so far. Animals uh, tend to stay where we leave them and only migrate in a natural way. Um, but it has been found that these animals will migrate up to five kilometres over. So us moving them around, which you're going to see a lot of in this presentation, uh, it isn't all that bad. Whereas in, um, in another group of animals, if, if you just took a whole bundle of snakes uh, or lizards even out of their area and just sort of dumped them elsewhere, like a couple of kilometres up the road, uh, it, it could be quite detrimental to their survival. But in the eastern long neck turtle, it's been proven uh, to be quite fine because they are quite a trend species anyway. <clears throat> uh, which brings me to my work at Turtle Rescues New South Wales. It is on a volunteer basis. Uh, where we just drive around Sydney picking up turtles that have been uh, lost in suburbia or find themselves on the road in wet weather. Uh, they've been picked up by residents or motorists. Uh, they've been dogs, they've been hit by lawnmowers, they've been run over on roads, whatever it might be. Uh, we provide a volunteer service to the community by picking these animals up from their homes or businesses or wherever it might be. And we get those animals uh, to the vet for uh, veterinary treatment or we get them back to the nearest waterway if they're uninjured. Uh, here's a few, uh, this was at, these four photographed today. So that's four that uh, were picked up today and have since been released. Uh, and the reason we do that is, um, here's a photo I took uh, two nights ago is on the Northern Road in Western Sydney. Um, which is a bit of a hot spot for, uh, for these animals because of all the wetlands and, and rural land in that area and also the high level of on those roads. So this is a new section of the Northern Road that's being built currently around the West Sydney Airport. Uh, and those four red dots uh, represent turtles that have been killed on the road. Um, so there's four dead turtles in that photo there. Uh, you can see one in the bottom left of the image. Um, so we can't... We do frequent turtle patrols, we call them a turtle patrol. So we head out in our vehicle and in times of rain and we just look for these animals and get them off the road. Um, right now, a lot of the females are gravid. Uh, they're holding eggs and they're looking for somewhere to lay them. Uh, so that sees them crossing the road uh, more frequently and in higher numbers. And that's why we've got four dead animals right there. Um, only found one live animal. Uh, so we saw 25 in total and only one of them was alive and uh, we managed to get her off the road. Uh, I will say um, there are some deceased animals in this presentation, so I apologise if that offends anybody. 
Uh, tonight, I'm really here to talk about how uh, we're seeing pristine wetlands like this um, go from uh, looking um, to looking like this in a number of weeks. Uh, that was 4,500 square metres surface area, that dam there. Um, so a lot of these dams are man-made, um, but over the last 100 or so years since they were built, uh, they have become our local species, including uh, birds, amphibians, mammals and reptiles. So all the major groups there um, and also fishes. Uh, so that was uh, 9,000 uh, 9, uh, litres of water there. Um, water there or, or four Olympic sized swimming pools of water in that dam. And here we are on the driest continent on earth. Um, draining that water out into the landscape and creating these barren wastelands. Um, and we're doing that for population boom, especially in Western and Southwest Sydney, where we've still got a lot of green space. Uh, they're currently clearing a lot of it so they can build homes and, and estates, infrastructure and uh, places for all of these people to work and go to school. Uh, yeah. Uh, a question that we um, get asked a lot is what happens to the wildlife um, when these processes are happening? Hung lizard um, sitting on a fallen tree and we can see the mounds, the big pyramids of um, bark behind it. Uh, they were once mature eucalypt trees and they'd all been shredded by the developers um, with no care for the wildlife on the site at all. And then uh, a whole bunch of eastern long neck turtles that were found in a drained dam here in southwest Sydney as well. Um, uh, a more appropriate question is what happened to the wildlife? Uh, because um, a lot of them are actually dead on, on the roads adjacent to these development sites. And that's often how we, I'll get rid of that photo, but that's often how we uh, get our calls to go into these sites because motorists find Turtles on one stretch of road, and uh, it, it's quite odd. I mean, it, it's it might be a little normal to see sad, uh, a couple of dead turtles in times of rain, but on a sunny day to find 15 or 20 dead turtles on one stretch of road, uh, there's generally something happening. And typically, what it is is a dam or wetland being drained by a developer, um, and those animals uh, have, having no mitigation in. Place the site and those animals are forced to leave the development site and cross the busy roads adjacent to that site and slow moving animal uh, not used to uh, avoiding cars they do get uh, killed and that is why essentially why we originally started rescues in south wales um, and that's an early mission statement that we developed uh, that it was our mission to remove and relocate fauna being displaced by the hasty dewatering of dams. And it is still true to this day, that is still our mission statement, but it has changed for all just to incorporate everything else that we're currently doing. <clears throat> so at Turtle Rescues New South Wales, uh, we focus on development sites uh, where nation has been put in place for these animals and uh, when these dams are drained on these sites, when these uh, big wetlands are drained, uh, the turtles have two options. Uh, they can either hide, I'll see if I can get this video to work. I can't see, oh, there's my cursor. Beautiful. I hope that video is playing for everybody. Uh, I'll just talk you through what's happening there. So uh, this dam has been drained in Southwest Sydney. Um, and that's a mature adult eastern long neck turtle. Now these animals have evolved here over millennia to survive in the dry and harsh conditions that Australia is known for. And in times of drought, drought happens naturally in Australia and these dams do dry up and our creeks do dry up. What these animals will actually do is bury themselves in the mud, just like this one is here, and they'll wait for rain to return and for these wetlands to fill back up so they can resume their natural behavior. Uh, but what's happening on these development sites is these animals are burying themselves in the mud and tricking the developers and civil contractors into thinking 
animals in the dam because how could there be any, any fish or any sort of aquatic fauna uh, living in the mud? Uh, so basically we get in the mud and remove those animals from that process before they're buried alive. Uh, now on a lot of these sites, um, when we arrive, sometimes it's too late and the animals have actually been buried alive. So uh, we'll dig through there with shovels and machines if they're available and show, show the developers what they've done because often they're just And that's where they all the dam, uh, and they generally do it uh, all at the same time. Um, and it's it's not always in the day. Sometimes it's overnight on the site for the day. The animals will um, try and leave when it's a bit cooler. They do like to travel at night as well because it's a bit cooler, and they can conserve water and energy, um, and also uh, you know not be attacked by predators and things of the sort. But uh, what's happening is these animals are leaving these dams and you can see all that's all turtle tracks all of those um, you can see their turtle feet and I mean there's there's a good uh, 20 sets of tracks there and typically we're finding anywhere from 30 to 50 animals in a sort of a I don't know what you'd call a normal size wetland but if you can imagine a small farm dam we're finding anywhere from 30 to 50 turtles in those uh, bodies of water and you can see a lot of those animals have already left this site uh, this is happening right now so this photo was just taken last week in western sydney we received a, a phone call from wives and they told that um, in blacktown council uh, there were several dead turtles on a road um, so uh, my colleague Shane and I head over there and this is the scenes that we were met with. So um, tracks, tracks leaving the mud and dead turtles on the road, um, which is just so typical of some of these sites that don't, um, just don't mitigate it correctly. So uh, that site, unfortunately, um, did have an economy on the site, um, but uh, they weren't physically there, they were just sort of providing a report. Um, and generally the report says uh, that that body of water has very low potential to harbour life. Uh, and, and that's how they're getting away with it because their environmental impact statements don't take into account all of the animals that actually live in and around these bodies of water because a lot of them are man-made. Uh, and it's a bit of a loophole in a lot of councils wording in their, um, in, in their development approvals that Anything that's man-made is that, and if it's not habitat, there can't be animals there. Um, so they're, they're free game, you know, these animals are just being crushed and buried alive and whatever else. And really that's what you should look like. Uh, that's my colleague Shane, there, my partner at Turtle Rescues. And that's what you should look like um, on those sites catching turtles. You should be uh, neck deep in the mud getting these animals before they're dug up by the excavator behind him there. And uh, this is what we do when we capture those turtles. So we take them uh, somewhere nearby, somewhere suitable, a more permanent wetland that's not about to be cleared for development. And we let those animals go and, and give them another chance at life so they can go out and they can breed and, uh, and continue that life. So here's a bit of a case study here. Um, I use this one because it's pretty typical. So close to my home here in Southwest Sydney. It's the Emerald Hills housing estate uh, that uh, commenced building in 2016. The Biodiversity Conservation Act came in and we can see two large dams on the site there. So this was December 2000. This is the smaller of the two dams uh, in the top of the image there. Um, this is that dam in the top and this is what the dam looks like. Um, and you just probably don't remember, but we were experiencing a heat wave, um, as we often do in December at, at that time. So this was, I think, about a week before Christmas that uh, we'd first received the call. The bottom dam had already been drained and there were several turtles dead on the adjacent road. Uh, and this is that bottom dam. So we can see what's happening here. So this, the, that vegetation there, those uh, mature eucalypt trees there, are actually part of the South West Sydney Wildlife Corridor. So those trees were left there um, and they are uh, Cumberland Plain woodland there. 
uh, and we see what's what's happening. So August 2016, two months later, um, right in the heart of spring, when a lot of those trees uh, would have been hollow bearing and you know um, arbor and, and families of animals, and they've chopped them all down, and then they mulch them all up, like we saw in that photo with the blue tongue earlier, and they drain the dam, and that's what it looks like. So. Um, we go from this, uh, you know, it, it probably is man-made and it's obviously historically agricultural land here in Southwest Sydney in the Camden Council District. Um, but a lot of animals do call that area home. A lot of our native wildlife rely on that water and rely on those trees for shelter and food and breeding opportunities and it's gone. And uh, this is what we were faced with on the site. So it might be a little hard to see, I'm not sure from your side, but. The, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, sorry, but these black dots here uh, that you can see in the water are actually long necked turtles um, breaching the surface and breathing. Uh, so there's uh, my colleague Shane again, going through the reeds, uh, collecting turtles and frogs, and whatever else. And there's a little dwarf green tree frog, uh, Latoria phallax, uh, watching its home disappear. And we were being told by the council, um, by the engineers, even by National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, there's no animals there because uh, they've got an environmental impact statement. There are no animals being affected by this development. And if they are, because the animals are in the direct path of development and um, basically too bad how sad. And that's what it looks like. And that's a dam with no animals in it uh, that we pulled about 50 turtles from, 50 adult long neck turtles. And uh, why is that happening? Why, why is this allowed to happen? Um, and it's because uh, if we have a look at that dam there um, and extrapolate it onto the price list at Emerald Hills, uh, the dam is 6,000 square metres um, and the average, that had averaged 10 to 12 lots of land at about $600,000. Um, so we're looking at about $6 million there. So $6 million is um, more important than life and biodiversity in these areas. Uh, and again, that's what it should look like um, when you're out there capturing animals in these sites. And there's a close up of some trap leaving the dam. And that's my son Ryder there helping to release some turtles uh, that we'd captured off another. And Shane uh, taking measurements. Uh, we do take measurements and uh, different observations of the animals so we can provide data to the University of Western Sydney for their wetland projects. Uh, but yeah, I will say also that it's not all bloom out there, we, um, uh, this animal here, we actually successfully hatched from uh, a deceased female. She had been run over next to one of these sites and she, she did have eggs spilling out of her body. Um, but we managed to harvest those eggs and bring them back here to wild, artificially incubate them. And about 60 days later, uh, the babies hatch. And that's what those babies look like. You can see it's still got the egg tooth on its nose there um, from chipping its way out of the egg. And we're able to take 10 of these babies. We've done it quite a few times, but that time uh, there were 10 babies in that clutch. I think she had 12 eggs in her all up, um, but two of them were bad from being hit by a car. Um, but the other 10, we managed to hatch them out, took them to a local wetland and we released them. So even though the, the mother was lost, uh, her genetic information was able to continue and we were able to give these animals uh, another chance at life. And uh, that's important also because um, obviously habitat loss isn't the only uh, driving factor um, for these animals to climb. So 95% uh, of their nests are actually being dug up by the European fox also. Uh, so not many are being found even when we go into these dams and, and rescue these animals. Um, probably close to 99% of those animals are actually adult. It's an aging population. There aren't many babies being born. And of those that are born, uh, not many of them make it into adulthood. 
so you can imagine the pressures that that's putting on uh, this species. Now, they are a long-lived animal. Um, it's been suggested that they could live up to 100 years. Uh, I do know of one record from Taronga Zoo of a 78-year-old animal. Uh, that, that recently died, unfortunately, but they did have paperwork to show that it was, um, yeah, about 80 years old. I'll just move my cat. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, these animals, they are a long-lived animal. And because we see them on our roads and we see them walking around, um, they seem to be quite common. Um, and it's that tragedy of the commons um, that is going to be their downfall because they haven't been listed as endangered or even threatened, um, they're actually a species of least concern um, with the IUCN. And that's because uh, they're just so, they're just everywhere. But uh, currently there's um, very minimal recruitment. Uh, there's no babies being, being born or surviving into adulthood really uh, in, in terms of population sizes. And a lot of these adult animals are being displaced by development. Uh, they're being run over on roads. Uh, that was 25 just two nights ago that we counted dead on a road, 25. How long could their population sustain those sort of losses? Um, uh, which is really sad. And, and it's, like I said, it's not just uh, long neck turtles. Um, it's a whole range of turtle species. So uh, this is a group that we recently supported in Queensland, it's an indigenous group called uh, Wild Projects. Uh, Wild stands for Where Youth Live Dream. So they uh, take indigenous youth and they give them opportunities um, for work and to learn history and culture. And they head out onto country and they protect turtle nests and they help to eradicate uh, feral pets and uh, exotic weeds and whatever else it might be. Uh, so we see here that those eggs there are um, from the critically endangered Elsaire albigola, the white-throated turtle. And uh, my friend Brad there, he's in the cage. Uh, our donation recently allowed them to buy that new cage. And what they, they go and they dig up these turtle eggs before the pigs and foxes dig them up. And then they put these eggs into this cage and that cage there can protect, I think it was about 40 nests. So they can go and collect 40 nests of eggs off the bank in that surrounding area. Uh, they very carefully uh, move them. Uh, they're working in conjunction with uh, Queensland Parks and they go and they move the eggs into these protection cages and they've got several of those cages now. And uh, once the animals hatch, they can release the babies back into the water. And that way, uh, they're skipping that uh, dangerous period of being in the ground where invasive predators like the fox and the pig dig them up. And here we are again, uh, this is the another farm several hours away from wild there. Uh, this is turtles of central Queensland. And they are working again with the um, endangered throat snapping turtle, but also the endangered uh, Fitzroy river turtle, the rare dighty flukops. Um, and that's actually a monotypic genus. Uh, uh, even rarer again, um, these turtles are uh, critically endangered. And um, they only exist in that range, in that small range, and they're being decimated by foxes and pigs, um, but also wetland degradation, um, agriculture and uh, runoff, um, damming of rivers, or whatever else it might be, um, our turtles are suffering. And that's why we do. Thank you. I'm not sure if I sped through that. Um, I was told I had about 40 minutes and normally I take an hour and a half, so I may have <laughs> sped through it, sorry. Um, no, no, Kane, that, that, that's great. Um, it's told us a, an awful lot, but I'm sure there are people with, uh, with questions. Are you happy to uh, continue on and um, take more questions? Oh, I'd love that, yes. Okay, well, I'll just go down to the, the chat function. Can everybody hear me out there? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So questions. Uh, you can uh, type something into the chat function. Uh, just say, um, I've got a question and um, I can uh, throw to you when, um, when your, your turn comes next. 
you can unmute and ask your question or you could type your whole question into the chat uh, section and, uh, and I can read it out for you. Uh, so whatever you'd prefer to do that. And I think there's a couple coming in. Um, Adrian, uh, you've got a question. Okay, oh, thanks. Uh... Um, Kane, a really interesting, yeah, really interesting presentation as always from a guest speaker. So thank you. Hey, um, I have a question related to where you like to relocate your turtles um, and turtle eggs. Uh, we've recently done some work down here three hours uh, west of Sydney uh, on a farm. We've done a lot of uh, tree planting there and there's a number of dams where um, our very good friend Vince Heffernan, who's a re a uh, regenerative agriculture guy and very very concerned about his environment and he's put he's got frogs returning to those dams and i'm not sure about turtles but there probably are turtles there i've seen one dead turtle caught in a fence there would have you done relocation as far as that and and what would be the problems with that over to you kane oh so we we wouldn't uh, relocate them that far um the license through national parks actually uh dictates that we only let them go up to 20 kilometres away from where they're found. But even 20 kilometres, um, it's, I don't really feel comfortable moving them that far. So we tend to try and stay within five to 10 kilometres because like I said before, um, studies have shown that they will uh, traverse five kilometres over land on their own. So we try and keep them in those sort of areas um, that they would be able to move on their own. Um, so generally what that would mean is in southwest Sydney, we would take them to the Nepean River. In western Sydney, we would take them to the Hawkesbury um, and just try and get them in, into wetlands that surround areas where they're naturally occurring already. Uh, sometimes we'll put them into those rivers and then they can use the river as a bit of a highway to get to where they need to, um, as they would anyway, you know. Sometimes, uh, as you can imagine, there are no wetlands within sort of five or ten kilometres. Um, so we, you know, we need to be a bit creative. Sometimes What's golf happening? courses and cemeteries, but also private land, like you said. Um, yeah, but it, it's it, it does get difficult trying to find um, good release sites because we also like it to be far from roads. Uh, you know, we need to make sure we're not disrupting the population that already lives there. Make sure there's enough food um, and whatever else. So. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Kane. Um, next question is from Graham Lalshare. Um, how are you funded? Oh, uh, so, uh, well, the work we do on development sites, we charge for. So uh, we are a, a professional firm. Um, we are fully insured and licensed to do that work. So uh, we, uh, yeah, just like any contractor, we get paid to do what we do. Um, but as far as... Uh, the volunteer side goes, I mean, that's all just self-funded. So whatever money uh, we can uh, raise through wild and through turtle rescues, we put it straight back into wildlife conservation. So uh, yeah, that's um, the donations that we made recently to those two groups in Queensland who are doing similar work to us. Um, so we've got sort of a large page on Facebook. Wild has about 30,000 followers on there. So we use that platform to um, get this message in and try and help some smaller groups. Uh, we recently hosted a wildlife art and photography exhibition in Sydney mm. last year. It was before the, um, before the restrictions. And we managed to raise a thousand dollars on that night um, selling uh, local wildlife photography and things like that and we donated five hundred dollars to each of those groups in Queensland to help with their turtle conservation so um, yeah we just uh, yeah just do our thing and um, yeah okay yeah. it sounds uh, like you've got a good spread though of, uh, of donations yeah um, the next question is from Greg Demore uh, do you find many foreign species of turtles uh, no, so in, in the past I have, um, in Sydney, I've found, um, I do a lot of diving in the rivers um, for turtle research. Uh, so I have found red eared slider turtles before, and we are working at the moment with the Department of Primary Industries um, on several management plans for that animal. Uh, so there's a population in Homebush and, and there's 
a, a few populations around, but they're more um, prevalent in Queensland. Um, but and also I've I've found uh, Mississippi mud in Sydney, which was probably a released pet um, or a released food item. Uh, they they have been imported before um, through the Asian markets for food um, and also uh, for the pet trade uh, through whoever. So. Yeah, we do sometimes come across foreign species. Uh, foreign species of snake are actually more common. So working as a snake catcher, it's it's not uncommon to be called to a corn snake or a boa constrictor, something of the sort, which are popular pets, but illegal here in Australia. Mm. Quite diverse again. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, next question is from Deb. Uh, how do you decide where to place cages? Could this screw the sex ratio no. of young, young turtles? No. <laughs> that was an unintended no. pun, I, pun, I assume. Yes, yes. 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 Is that the iPad was um, changing my spelling. I meant skew the sex ratio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. So those cages, yeah, yeah, those cages that they're using... Um, no, I the, just couldn't skew the sex ratio because that's um, generally temperature dependent. Um, well, that's what I meant. How did you choose where to place them? Because are you choosing the same environment as the turtles chosen? Uh, could you inadvertently be um, influencing the ratio if they're not placed in the same kind of situation? Yeah, so uh, you could be if you're artificially incubating them, how we have done... Uh, deceased uh, females where we've extracted the eggs. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a recent paper put out, I think it was in 2019, and it actually showed the embryos will um, thermoregulate as well. So they'll mm -hmm. move around the egg um, to get an optimum temperature and uh, uh, they can control their own uh, sex by moving closer or further from the heat and even just being on the bottom of the egg versus of the egg can um, change the temperature by one degree, which is often all that's needed to um, change their sex, So, mm. uh, mm. which is pretty interesting. But the ones uh, in Queensland um, where they're moving the eggs, uh, so they're just reburying those eggs uh, at, at the same depth that the animals um, would have done it. And they're using the same banks that those eggs are already found on. And that's led by... Um, uh, another guy with uh, UCN, Duncan Limpus, and he's been working with those species since the 90s. Um, so it's all science-based and, mm -hmm. um, you know, every effort is made to keep this as natural as possible uh, while also, uh, you know, providing uh, assistance um, because it's really the only way that these animals are going to survive. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question is from Wendy Briggs. What's your staffing like? How many full-time workers? How many volunteers? Our staffing is essentially um, me, my wife, and uh, my colleague Shane Davies. Uh, so just a small team. Um, we've also got an ecologist who works alongside us, um, my good friend Chad. Uh, but as far as volunteers go, I mean, it's sort of uh, up and down and uh, because because we need to be licensed and insured, um, it's pretty tricky for volunteers to come in and help. They can only help with certain activities. Um, National Parks have made it pretty clear that um, nobody else is allowed to touch the animals because they're protected. So, yeah, it's but really, yeah, it's just very small team and uh, f very family-based. Okay, um, thanks for that. Uh, next question is from Megan. Uh, do you have advice on artificial habitat islands for dams in relation to the eastern long neck turtle? Yeah, so uh, artificial dams should be uh, dug as deep as possible and as large as possible um, in surface area. Uh, they should uh, try and maintain native vegetation uh, and be as natural as some good basking areas are good, like sunken logs. Um, also, uh, for long-necked turtles, they enjoy uh, deep sediment, so lots of 
pollen. So if you can age that wetland for a while or, or even add your own sediment from elsewhere, uh, that's always helpful for them. And uh, they need a variety of prey species, um, which generally come if you dig a hole and fill it with water anyway. So you'll get a whole bunch of um, invertebrates, but, you know, um, uh, crayfish and small fish, uh, but generally they'll feed on like nymphs and, and things like that tadpoles while they're young and and then as they get older they'll start to eat a lot of vegetation as well um but as for turtle islands the ricky spencer from the university of western sydney who we work with he recently advised on a turtle island at glenbrook lagoon in the uh, lower blue mountains there and uh basically it's it's a floating um a nesting ground Basically, they just uh, created a floating island and, and filled it with sand and soil and put some ramps on it and put it out to the middle there. And then I think they anchored it so the turtles can get up and lay their eggs on an island and not be at risk of fox predation. So um, that's another myth. Is this affected if there's a population of native wood ducks that will use the island? Well, the also? turtles are pretty... Um, Turtles are pretty uh, funny in, in the sense that they'll sort of nest anywhere. Like we found them nesting right next to footpaths and on sporting fields. And I don't think if wood ducks were up there, it would bother them all that much. Um, and I, I'm not sure of any work that's been done uh, that, you know, but. Um, Is there any uh, literature, sorry, no. um, around what they did um, uh, I'm looking for information behind how they constructed it and what they constructed it out of. Um, is there, do you know if you could guide me towards any literature well, that was, on that what was, they used? Uh, uh, only in the grey literature. So um, uh, among my many roles, I'm also the editor at the Australian Herb Society of the annual publication, The Red-Bellied Courier. And I did get Ricky Spencer to um, submit an article in this year's one um that's uh the, i think they just used like pvc pipes to float it yeah. then, like a timber frame and then uh they just filled it with sand and soil so but i think that he will have a paper he, he does put a lot of papers out if you um go Let's to google um, it. yeah if you go to google scholar um or if you've got access through um an institution uh, and just google ricky spencer turtles um, I mean, you'll okay. find all of his latest Great. stuff. So we just worked Thank on a, um, that's okay. We just worked on a wetland hotspot project with them, which is what those two had the radio transmitters on them for. And, and that was, uh, I mean, they found that 40,000 turtles have been displaced or, um, from development in Western Sydney for 40,000 turtles. Mm, that's enough. Thank you. Um, uh, Kane, another question. Are developers sympathetic? This is from Matt Allison. Are developers sympathetic when they realise that there are remnant native animals on site or do they just see it as slowing down progress? It's really um, a mixed bag. I, I'd probably say 50-50, you know. Some of them um, are of the attitude that we're um, tree huggers or something or, or that we're there to... Um, you know, chain ourselves to their machines and stop the work. We just want to ensure the welfare of the animals. I mean, I don't think we can stop development and, and that's not what our projects are about. Um, but developers who, once we draw their attention to it, um, are actually quite concerned and really want to make sure the right thing's done, you know, and, and, um, and they can't praise us enough. And there's several who we've now got ongoing contracts with and, and we work with them. So we recently worked on Northern Road upgrade around the Western Sydney airport. Um, and uh, we're about to start another large project down in South West Sydney, down, down in Appen. Um, so we've got, got quite a few contracts happening um, with, uh, I guess you'd call them good developers or, or um, you know, ecologically conscious developers, but um, there's plenty who, we're just banging our heads against the wall and we found ourselves um, having to, you know, report them to council and whoever else might listen because they're just not doing the right thing. So, yeah, real mixed bag there. 
Um, so I guess another question following on from that is Graham Lausch here. Are authorities changing their requirements on developers after you alert them and or developers to what should be done? Yeah, so we recently advised on the word rewording of um, the dam dewatering process. So uh, they call it dewatering where they drain these dams and they've since added a clause. Um, the clause used to just say that um, efforts should be made to uh, check for animals during the process, um, but they've been a lot more specific now in our advice and it does say that an ecologist needs to be present uh, while the water is drained and any animals there need to be um, uh, treated humanely in line or in accordance with the Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, so we've managed to have that implemented in um, three or four councils down here in, in southwest and western Sydney. Um, some are still pretty stubborn, um, like Camden Council. They're, they're not, they haven't been very helpful um, in that department. Uh, but yeah, we're still pushing and, and that's why we're working with the university so we can um, get some literature to support those claims as well. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, and just at the other end of the scale um, from Graham, do you, are you doing any work with local schools to explain what you do? Yeah, so whenever I'm offered an opportunity to uh, give a talk like this one, um, yeah, we always, take it on because uh, it's a great opportunity to spread the word of uh, and, and get that awareness out there. So um, we've given talks to scout groups and um, primary schools and high schools and um, really whoever whoever will listen, I'll true that. So um, we we go around to all of the uh, all the community events like um, like Riverwatch. We were at, at Riverwatch two years in a row at out of there. I'm just talking about animals that are found along that river and, and its tributaries. Um, and yeah, generally I'll, I'll get up on this give a presentation. Um, so yeah, yeah, we do do, do a lot of that. Um, but we do use social media for a lot of that stuff as well. Um, I know kids aren't on social media. Um, yeah, we, we spread the word as much as we can. Ah, sounds great, sounds great. Um, another one from Janine. Are any local councils in the area contributing to actually creating some alternative wetland slash habitat areas? Yeah, so uh, the project that we're about to undertake in Appen, um, they're actually building five new wetlands. Uh, so we'll be advising on that habitat while they build them. Uh, they are draining nine and getting nine wetlands on that site, um, which is unfortunate, um, but they are going to build five new ones that we'll be able to use in the future for a, a release site. And, um, and we're hoping to make those as natural as possible so we can encourage uh, locally um, extinct species to remove, to, to, to return to that site, um, such as uh, green tree frogs and things of the sort that haven't been seen there for quite a while. Okay. Um, another one from Sonia. How pollution tolerant are they and can they live in brackish water? Uh, so some of our turtles can live in brackish water. Um, uh, the, the pignose turtle can live in brackish water. Also the long neck turtles, I mean, you find them in the brackish section of the river where the weir meets. Um, so they're, they're pretty tolerant, they're pretty tough animals. Long neck turtles, um, eastern long neck turtles in particular seem to be the most uh, tolerant of pollution um, and sort of habitat change that, because uh, they're used to sort of living in stagnant bodies of water. Um, but a lot of river dwelling species um, really need fast flowing clean water. Um, so they suffer a lot more and, and that's why uh, our endangered species of turtle all seem to be um, river dwelling animals um, and uh, where they really need flowing in clean water. So that Manning River turtle that I was talking about before, um, that one there, the Manning River turtle, uh, their, their biggest threat is um, wetland degradation. So their river actually goes right through agricultural land. There's a lot of cattle grazing in the area. Uh, so the cattle are trampling nesting sites. Um, they're eroding nesting sites as well um, through grazing and trampling. 
there's a lot of fertilizer use in the area, um, poison like 1080 and whatever else to protect livestock. So all of that sort of stuff, control the fertilizer, whatever else, it's all running off into the river. And, um, you know, these turtles are suffering because of it. Not far from here, uh, a mystery virus swept through the Bellinger River and killed uh, about 90% of the um, adult population of turtles there. Uh, until there was less than 200 turtles left um, in the world of that species. Um, that's the George's eye, the, uh, the Bellinger River snapping turtle. So, uh, and th there's a breeding project now, you might have seen it on the news at the zoo where they're breeding those turtles and, and releasing them back into the river. Um, but that mystery virus, I mean, it, it was probably, um, you know, created through our behaviours up there on the river, you know, all, all of those chemicals and whatever else flooding into the river. So, um, you know, they can be pollution, but like all animals, they've got a threshold. And once we pass that, um, we're going to see extinction events. Mm. Sounds serious. Um, another question from Vicky. Uh, I don't know whether you mentioned this earlier, um, but um, when they... How long can turtles survive after they bury themselves in the mud? Oh, well, as long as there's moisture there. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say indefinitely, but uh, they can survive a good three months without food. Um, so really, they, like over winter, they don't eat. Um, so during those cooler months, uh, you know, really reptiles can survive. Uh, there's been literature supporting it up to a year without food. Uh, so as long as they've turtles, especially as long as they go into a um, uh, like a torpor um, or like, and they'll just stay under there until the rains come back. So um, yeah, for a very long time. Yeah, oh, an amazing animal by the sound of it. Mm. Uh, just a follow up from Sonia. Do you want to ex explain this one, Sonia? Unmute yourself and make this point. No, you there, Sonia? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, this uh, last point uh, you've um, got there. Yes, Kane, we have um, long necked turtles in our local wetlands, and yep. sometimes I see them wandering in the bush heading away from the wetland and I know there's no water apart from the wetland. Should I just leave them there or do I take them back to the wetland? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so uh, it's a tough question, isn't it? Um, I mean, uh, like I said before, they will travel up to five kilometres over land um, and potentially even further. I mean, that was just one study that found that. So. If you can imagine five kilometers in any direction, you know, they, they generally will find, an, uh, you know, some sort of water, whether it's a creek or, um, or some sort of uh, man-made drainage system where they can follow it um, to a wetland, you know, but uh, it, sometimes, sometimes it's best to take them back to the water, but I don't like to interfere too much unless you sort of feel you have to. Um, so. If, <laughs> yeah, it's hard, hard to advise on that, but generally I would look on a map and see um, where, where the nearest water is and um, wonder if it can make it there. And if you don't think it can, maybe pop it back into the wetland. Where, where our um, local wetlands are, they do have um, sewage overflows and, I mean, the water quality is not great. So I never know whether they're wandering around trying to find cleaner water so mm. it's a bad move to put them back or I don't know should I take them to an, another pond that I know of well it's um look gen generally it's best to give them if they I mean they found themselves there somehow anyway so they've come from somewhere um and it's I, I mean you put them back in water and and then they just walk back out or you take them somewhere else and you you know you might have disrupted some sort of natural behavior that they were that they were trying to fulfill so uh, generally 
it's best just to leave them doing what they're doing unless they're sort of in imminent danger of death, you know. So we, I'll, I'll only move them um, if I find them on a road or, or near a road and usually I'll just move them uh, to where they're going um, or just to the nearest waterway. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't... If I just find one sort of wandering in the bush... Um, um, yeah, you can go and put it back on this on the shore of the wetland there. Um, yeah, but it's probably fine to give it. And I, I have also found them, I don't know if you know Oatley, but on the Georges River, and the water here is quite salty. It's more than brackish. And I found them in the water in the river here. And is that okay for them? Uh, they, they can be pretty tolerant of it because they're not, um, they don't breathe it uh, like, you know, they're not a fish, they've got lungs, so they, uh, they're they not breathing the water. So it generally won't affect them too much, but if they're there long term, it can. Um, but they'll just get out and go for a wander and find something fresher when they need to, you know. So um, they'll just find a golf course or a cemetery, one of those um, wetlands that you see on those properties and um, make themselves at home. So. They use those rivers as like arteries to travel between all those um, different spots. Okay. okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Adrian, um, a, a late one. Um, do you want to unmute and ask this one about um, raid? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Uh, uh, Kane, yeah, we've, um, earlier in the year we had a very interesting talk from uh, Eric Rudowski of RAID, uh, who's, um, they've been fighting the intermodal development down in Norbank, I'm sure you've heard about. Have you done any work with him and, and, and the RAID in that area and what's your comments and what... Uh, what Sorry, Adrian. Yeah. Hold the microphone oh, fast. Sorry. Yeah, start again. Right? Yeah, we got, um, yeah, we, um, Eric Rudowski and Raid uh, gave us, a, from Raid, gave us a very interesting talk earlier in the year on the intermodal development and the fiasco there. Uh, if you'd only work with him and, and uh, in that area of, and rescuing turtles from the Georges River in the uh, area. Oh, yes. I, I, I know Eric, actually. I had dinner with him. Um, I, I didn't recognise the name until you said intermodal. But, yeah, I had dinner with him um, last year, uh, speaking intermodal. So I actually grew up in Chipping Norton on the Georges River there. Um, so I'm very familiar with that area. That's um, where I learned to catch uh, turtles and snakes as a kid. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're actually, we've just recently been engaged um, by the intermodal at Moorbank there to... Um, go onto the site and and advise on uh, turtle populations and make sure they're treated uh, humanely um, during the development there. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. I actually just um, handed in the paperwork this week. And um, yeah, so that's been one that I've wanted to uh, be involved with for a while because, um, I mean, on, on the other side, uh, development uh, wetland was drained last year I think it was and or it could have been the year before and um, I was handed several turtles um, from that site that had sort of found themselves wandering across the road there um, and uh, you know so I, I prefer to be involved um, not that we do it better than other people or something like that but I mean you know if, if you're hands-on you can sort of um, you know, based on your own integrity and just know that you're doing a good job and doing the right thing by the animals. So that's, I, I would prefer to be involved, you know, than sort of um, walking from afar and picking up stray animals as they wander off the site. Okay. Um, look, I think uh, we've had a, a fantastic session here tonight, Kane, and I'm just going to uh, pass over now to Matt Allison. Um, to propose a vote of thanks uh, to you from off. So over to you, Matt. Thanks, Kim. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Thanks so much, Kane, for, for your time, but more essentially, thanks for what you do. Um, I don't know how you keep your head above water, you know, sorry, pun unintended, but with, to see so much of Western Sydney going brick and tile and, um, 
I, I can't see an end to it, really. It's, it's madness. But mm. you're out there, uh, you know, trying to make the most of what, what is left. And um, that's so admirable. Um, keep it up, <laughs> please, for the yeah, sake so, of the Thank you. Yeah. And look, thanks on behalf of Off, you know, for, for everything you do. You're a champion. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And um, I mean, we don't do it for praise, obviously. I, I've animals since I was, uh, since I can remember, you know, I, I think I got my first pet turtle when I was about four. My father brought it home. Um, you know, he was a driver and he found it crossing a road. And, and uh, my grandfather gave me a blue tongue when I was about that same age, four or five years old. And I've just, since then, I've been by them I've just always had this intense fascination with them um, and I always knew that I was going to work with them in some capacity uh, and that's that's what drives this it's um, it's passion and yeah it's that's what I said before it's not not a job it's my life so <laughs> that's why if you could live your life like that you're doing you know so well oh that's right yeah it's not it's um, I, I mean it's it's sad. Um, it is sad watching it all, old, you know, but we have a lot of great days as well and a lot of great adventures and stories. And um, I've got three children of my own that I'm raising uh, along the way and, and alongside all those rescuing. And I mean, there's a lot of heartbreaks there, seeing those, those deceased animals and things like that and all that development and the trees being pushed over and that. But I mean, you can't just not do it. So... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. which is why we're all here tonight as well. I mean, you guys are all uh, part of this society. Um, obviously, the love of the natural world. So, um, thank you all. Yeah. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Matt. And uh, I'll back up Matt's uh, uh, thanks there. Uh, fascinating. There's messages coming in saying what a fascinating talk and what a fascinating, fabulous presentation. So uh, it's been great. Uh, thanks, Kane. Oh, great. Um, Thank 